All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is John Pobans uh, from Ogden, Utah. I know some of the folks on the list. Uh, fun to have you out. Uh, I don't see um, too many familiar faces of people or names of folks that have heard me perhaps speak before. Um, if you have, um, you probably know that I have a passion for mini screw mechanics. Uh, I feel like it's a, a modality that is underutilized in our specialty at the moment, uh, statistically somewhere with 20 to 30 percent of us are consistently placing them. I think that goes hand in hand with micro perforation because it's such an obvious um, collaboration between the two things and creates so much comfort for the clinician to go from one thing to the next and have both in their practice. And so I've been involved for quite a while um, doing micro perforations in my practice for the last three years. And so they, they asked me then to be here with you and share kind of an introductory 60 min minutes um, where we're going to talk about some of my experiences and show some of the things that I like to do with both passive self-ligation, mini screw mechanics, and then now acceleration. And the, the key thing that I'd like to point out is that we're performing localized inflammation that is uh, convenient, that is inexpensive, and that is incredibly robust for spe very specific applications and uh, also for very, very robust for a broad range of applications. Uh, to me, the most versatile use of acceleration that we have uh, at the moment in orthodontics. So um, I have a declaration of interest then to make also in that uh, I am a consultant to Propel. Uh, I don't... Uh, have any kind of uh, ongoing income from them other than honorariums for speaking on occasion. Uh, I'm also the owner of an LLC uh, company that distributes a, a mini screw. Uh, I've used several different systems over the years and this is one out of Taiwan that I'm excited about but I have to disclose that that, that I actually have ownership in uh, the mini screws that you'll see in this uh, presentation. Um, as far as background I went to Nebraska. I've been here in my hometown for 18 years. Uh, I like to teach. I teach in Tom Pitts's UOP clinic at the University of Pacific in uh, California in San Francisco, which is a fantastic experience as he's in his twilight of his career. Um, given quite a few lectures on different things, written a few articles, mostly over the last five years. Doing a little bit less of that these days, but uh, really happy to have the opportunity to do this webinar series with all of you. A lot of you know me as a skier, or, or maybe you don't, but I, I do like to ski a lot. Uh, I, I find myself on the mountain, especially this year, quite a bit, and uh, now and then I'll make my way to Valdez, Alaska. That's this little peninsula out here in this bay. The famous Exxon uh, Valdez spill took place in this bay, and that's the, the little town of Valdez, Alaska. So the Chugach uh, mountain range is an amazing place to go helicopter skiing access terrain like this and have experiences going down slopes like this. So we have really, really amazing snow in Utah uh, this year and I'm, I'm finding time to get there in between time that I spend with my family. I've got three older kids. My son Joel there is, is 21 at Utah State where I went to school and talking about business and hopefully some interest in dentistry. I have two 16-year-old daughters Jane over here, my blue-eyed one, is adopted and seven months older than Beth. Uh, juniors and a junior and a sophomore, respectively, in in high school, uh, chasing boys, playing sports, having fun. My wife Angela uh, is a clinical psychologist, and uh, I had been through a divorce and recently remarried uh, this past year, and she's just become an amazing light in my life. And her little boy Elias, my stepson, is a seven-year-old. Uh, we're uh, forging our our new blended family with vigor and one of the reasons you probably see me doing a little less speaking is because of this and I gotta say that it's been a, a wonderful positive change. So um, this is my work family then and um, we are actively uh, engaged in one common effort and that is we're committed to becoming better every day. Uh, we uh, are um, 
constantly seeking ways to improve, and I think acceleration is definitely in that category. A lot of these ladies have been with me since the very beginning, so I acknowledge them and everything I do. It's fun to put work family and home family on the screen and, and uh, give credit to the people who make what we do possible as clinicians and, and business owners. Uh, the agenda then for today's time spent will be to review current options for acceleration. We're going to talk about the animal and human study, uh, not in a lot of you know intense detail, but enough that uh, newcomers to the topic can at least gain appreciation for the science that's behind all of this. And then some applications. Um, you know, the whole the overall series is is advanced applications. Some of these are advanced to to, to many. Uh, some of them are uh, intermediate to some. So the audience um, is kind of variable that way. Um, I think. Today gives you a, an overall feel of, of things that I like to do in my practice, uh, uses of Anchorage, and as we go forward, what I'd like to challenge the group to do is submit cases to me. Submit things to me that are problematic, challenges. Submit things to me that you've done, that you're excited about, that may be spin-offs of things that I've shown. I'm a constant student in that regard and that I really don't ever feel like I've finished a perfect case, but rather. Uh, I'm always seeking uh, better ways to do stuff like everybody else that's here spending an hour on a you know a Tuesday night when you could be running home to family or, or doing otherwise. So I'm, I'm grateful that everybody's here and, and willing to participate. We can't you know talk about tooth movement without putting up this famous slide of the tension of the pressure side. Uh, we know about vascular constriction on the pressure side the biological cascade of events that occurs with fibers and proliferation of cellular activity. Uh, we know that blood vessels are compressed on that side and uh, excessive pressure can uh, actually be detrimental, uh, leading to uh, undermining resorption. Our goal is to create frontal resorption, light continuous forces with osteoclasts being activated from that pressure and being active, um, you know, creating translation if our mechanics are well defined. In the presence of heavy force though, we know that the osteoclasts then seek then the, the lacunae and they go from the underside and create um, jumping uh, movements and so continuous movements are our goal. And being a student of all these things, all of us um, you know, apply this biology every day and sometimes forget uh, the cellular level of what we're doing and we just view you know, teeth as individual objects that we bully into position rather than delivering them uh, lightly and continuously where they need to go. Uh, understand the osteoblasts and osteoclasts communicate with each other through chemical messengers and, and it's a phenomenal event that creates this cascade of, of change of bony resorption and bony formation. And um, it's really well established in the literature that uh, these um, Cellular messengers are the key players, cytokines, specifically interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha, uh, along with uh, the other chemical messengers of prostaglandins, etc. This concept of regional accelerator phenomenon, first coined by Frost, is um, sometimes misunderstood that it has something to do with acceleratory tooth movement, but in reality it's the acceleration of, of fracture healing that Frost studied and used to, to help uh, understand that this is an acceleration of osteoclast recruitment and osteoblastic activity. And in the area of localized inflammation uh, and in the presence of wound healing, that's what we experience and, and see. Um, and that then has been then used in the orthodontic descriptions of upregulation, essentially, of tooth movement. Uh, we notice that Patients that uh, have perhaps pregnancy seem to have efficient tooth movement or we seem to notice that um, certain uh, patients that have had osteotomy cuts um, after maybe a surgery first procedure um, or you know detailing after traditional orthognathic sequencing also creates uh, advantageous effects for us. Um, the removal of wisdom teeth uh, helps us to create bony remodeling and osteoblastic, osteoclastic activity and helps us finish cases along the way. The uh, removal of bicuspids after the appliances are on and then you know initiating alignment into those uh, 
um, extraction space it seems to be relatively efficient and we enjoy seeing that because we have so many other inefficiencies that we deal with in what we do. So these are all things that we can all relate to and have seen. So it's a quick review of biology and you know when we consider options that are out there there's the piezo incision which is localized or general with electric exposure, there's generalized corticotomies, there's generalized vibration, there's even generalized light exposure and now localized trauma being uh, now a, a new argument. Patient controlled acceleration would fall under these categories. We've got this light activated bone regeneration that's out there and being beta tested right now. This is the um, device. It isn't necessarily headgear. That's a bit of a typo there, but it's rather similar to the vibration device that's on the market in the form of a mouth guard. Not yet FDA approved in the United States, but supposedly it's going to be a shorter um, uh, compliance experience for patients, but still relies upon them to do at least six minutes. Um, price has not been set for that yet. Uh, those who are involved, there are some clinicians here in the U.S. that are um, beta testing. Several friends of mine are even talking about it. But to me, the obstacles still are cost and and compliance when it comes to that. Um, certainly competitive with the alternative that's out there at 20 minutes a day. But nevertheless, there's loss of devices and, and there are issues with people actually following through day to day to day to day. So uh, images of uh, generalized corticotomy then, the, the uh, um, very um, astute and um, learned uh, Will Kodonic brother, brothers that have brought that to the table years ago uh, are, are, are very recognized in the uh, literature for their contribution that way. Um, my challenge with that is, is, is the discomfort that's involved, the, the referral to another surgeon, the cost, the obstacle to case acceptance when patients really understand what they're uh, um, committing to, and ultimately there's just such a small percentage of people that will actually go through with it um, that it becomes you know, a bit of a challenge. Piezo then requires another uh, instrument, uh, more training, again another referral. Um, and you know, with that referral, then cost becomes a factor. So this microscopy of perforation, the uh, FDA-approved um, stainless steel tipped device that allows us to do multiple perforations without fracture of that tip, um, that's secure, that unlike a mini screw, could fall loose in the mouth, could be aspirated, could even fracture, especially if it's titanium. Big difference there is a stainless steel tip relative to a titanium tip. Uh, relatively low cost compared to all the modalities that have been discussed. The training for the clinician is really quite simple, especially if they've had any exposure to mini screw placement at all. And at the end of the day, being able to localize it, being able to put that inflammation right where you want it, when you want it, in the perhaps segment of movement relative to the anchor, or, or I should say, as opposed to the anchorage unit that you're creating with your mechanics. All of that just resonated with me so dramatically when I first heard about this in the fall of 2012 that I immediately got involved and, like other things, wanted to be an early adopter. So with that, I got involved and I actually wrote this little summary of all these different comparisons. If you want to see it and bring it up in the May 2013 archive of Orthotown and have a written discussion of the things that I've presented in these slides. Uh, I had some assistance from a couple of other great authors, Dr. Strino and Dr. Nikosesis, that are recognized as people that like to share information. So bottom line is we create wrap, you know, we make essentially a, a uh, perforation interradicular, uh, at least five millimeters from the gingival margin, and st try to stay in keratinized tissue as much as we can. Um, as far as the history of the company goes, you know, they got started in 2011, and the, the clinical trial, uh, you know, then was launched in 2012. They had a thousand devices out there in 2013. This is when I was doing a lot of the cases that I'm showing now. And then the newest generation of the instrument is this, this handle that is autoclavable and it has these disposable tips. There's one that's an open tip that does not have a plastic sleeve over the top of it, which is the one I prefer because I like to really visualize that tip. Others like the sleeve over the top because it gives you then a depth guide. Um, I think I, I, I can just visualize the amount of threads on, the, on that tip well enough that, and I know how deep I want to go, which in general is 
is um, about five to seven millimeters for me. And depending upon the anatomical location, I eyeball it and feel good about it. And you know, with that, uh, I feel like most of the procedures that I've done have been effective to get what I want. So that's you know a brief brief history of the company from that standpoint. Um, how does it work? Well, I think we've talked about the mechanism uh, that it can be used essentially with anything. Uh, it could accelerate even sure smile cases. It could ex it could accelerate um, clear correct cases. Obviously, uh, you know, regardless of how we're applying force to the teeth, the biology and the acceleration of that biology is the same. So this is what the snow is like in Utah these days. We're having a fantastic snow year, like I mentioned. Got two more storms on the calendar for the week. Got several friends coming into town from out of state to go and hit the slopes with me on Friday. I'm excited about that. Any of you who ever want to you know, come to Utah and spend a day uh, with me, you're, you're certainly welcome. Winter is, is just as good as the summer if you don't like um, snow skiing. Though we do a lot of downhill mount, mountain biking and other things. And, water skiing around here too. Uh, as far as science goes, you know, we had both an animal and a human study leading up to FDA approval of the device. Um, Teixeira and others uh, were looking at the cytokine expression and they also created then this animal model where it was a, a rat model like a lot of us have worked with. Um, you know, they created an appliance that delivered 100 grams of force to one of these rat molars and did perforations at a distance of four millimeters away just uh, with burr punctures. And um, with that, you know, they're orthodontic uh, group only, and then they had their orthodontic plus perforation group. And, you know, consistently that rat model and that animal study showed these types of physical changes of, in the same amount of time, more movement happening. And then they looked at cytokine expression in the model, and all the famous uh, well-known cytokines were upregulated, as you would expect, and bone remodeling from different views, including this micro CT analysis, showed osseoclast recruitment being upregulated in the presence of perforations. And then, of course, the histology, you know, was was done well and, and showed the same thing of the periodontal ligament of the rat. So again, you know, there's science behind this. There's, you know, things we can hang our hat on. It seems intuitively obvious, but there are those who really want to see data like that and know that uh, there's history. And so there you go. And once upon a time, I could do a 360 like that, but uh, not so much these days. That's an image from the archive. The study then showed up in the AJO and uh, has given it a lot of credibility across the board. Um, you know, it was a split mouth clinical study with 20 um, adults that had uh, bicuspids removed. It was a, a classic canine retraction study that was done with uh, model measurements and uh, also the uh, measurement of inflammatory markers and essentially 2.3 fold increase the velocity of movement on the control side in the presence of osteoperforations relative to the other and as much as a 62% improvement. And this is, you know, the way they set that up. They were really careful to prevent tipping with their mechanics and even a mini screw there. And, you know, power arms to get to the center of resistance. Um, just one example of the uh, tooth movement in the presence of perforations, where there's not so much uh, on the opposite side. And then their cytokines mirrored uh, the animal study. Upregulation of interleukin-1, you know, alpha, beta, IL-8, IL-10. And that they, they seem to have that response that continued to go six, eight, even ten weeks out from the perforation. That's why the, the timeline now clinically that people are uh, generally using is about a ten-week effect, a ten-week, ten-millimeter sphere of influence, essentially, around each individual perforation. And that's, that's the guideline that I use also. And in the beginning with this, you know, in 2012 and that first part of 2013, we were probably over perforating. We were doing a lot of extra perforations when we didn't need to, and maybe even over overdoing the amount of discomfort patients were experiencing. But you know that's how we all are. If a little's good, a lot's probably better, and not necessarily when it comes to the biology of tooth movement. Less force is better, and the least amount of perforations for acceleration is certainly better for everybody in terms of chair time, in terms of patient comfort, and uh, you know managing the instrument and all of that. So again, the, t the key points of the clinical study then were a 2.3-fold increase in velocity. 
Um, with bodily movement, uh, patients really didn't experience a lot of discomfort. I'll echo that, that um, you know, over hundreds of experiences now, uh, we are, you know, generally telling people to just take Tylenol for uh, a couple of days. Every now and then you'll have someone who's, you know, ultra sensitive. There seem to be the same category of patients that would complain anyway, who say that it's, it's difficult. Uh, I could probably think of two times where I did one procedure, 10 weeks later, the, the treatment um, scenario called for another one, and the patient declined, maybe twice out of, I don't know, at least at least 200 or more. So I feel like we can confidently tell people that this is not an overly invasive thing and definitely better than um, some of the other doctor-controlled, um, localized, and, and even generalized uh, methods of acceleration that are out there. So the technique, well, before we even get to the technique and, and how we do it, we've got to make sure that patients are, are ready, you know, to accept it and prepared for the procedure. And I just always start with a question. Um, you know, if I could take this particular canine that's in the roof of your mouth and move it over into his parking place in half the amount of time, would you be interested? Or you're wearing your aligners for um, 14 days. Uh, we're going to program it so that you can go to seven. Or at least maybe a better question is, you know, a lot of aligner practitioners are prescribing 14 day tray tooth movements. We like to do seven day tray, to tray movements in our practice, but if there was a way to take it now that you've worn them for a week or two from seven all the way down to three, would you be interested? And so I posed that question and virtually everybody said yes. Um, when then I, I used the analogy of an ear piercing, which I've often used in mini screw placement, it also puts it into context of what to expect. I show the instrument. I point out what it is. Uh, I talk about, you know, a pin in their eyeglass and taking that out. It's just a little bit longer than that. And so that makes, it minimizes it, uh, gives it uh, tangibility. And then I say, it's just like going to the mall and getting your ear pierced. You would allow a 16-year-old untrained individual to pierce your body right here in this fleshy area of your ear. Um, and so we're going to propose a piercing inside your mouth where we'll place this instrument, it'll go into a shallow depth of, you know, three to four to five millimeters and um, take it back out. Uh, and with that, your body will react and, and speed up the tooth movement. They virtually all understand that. That analogy helps them figure it out. Because when you just say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, start perforating the bone, the word perforation starts to become kind of, uh, you know, scary. Um, but I like saying things like, if we're going to make a gentle indentation in the bone between the roots of these two teeth, and as we um, go through the, the gum tissue, it's about like getting your ear pierced. Things like that. Just put it into context for them. Uh, reassurance, you know, a lot of times uh, there'll be someone else in the in the office who's had it done, either a mini-screw placed or, or otherwise, and we'll just uh, have that person come over and just tell them, you know, how, what it was like to have this done. And, you know, how'd you feel the next day? And, and uh, I really have never had a negative scenario come up where someone talked someone else out of it. So the messaging is, you know, critical and important. Um, to do this, you got to evaluate the treatment area, palpate the tissue, look at your x-ray. You need to, uh, you know, control bacteria with chlorhexidine rinse two times for one minute each. Um, apply the topic, uh, excuse me, apply the topical with a single ply of gauze. So there's a special topical out there called Badass Topical or the Badass Ass Topical in town. <laughs> That's what people are calling it, BTT. Uh, Dr. Shipley and some others have come up with that. I'm just a student of it. But create a single ply of gauze that's um, about 35 millimeters long and about 5 millimeters wide. Um, maybe this one in this example here with these CS2000 springs is just a little bit wider than that. But you then... Apply that topical, and I've got a slide with the formula here in a second, but you apply that topical to the gauze. The mistake sometimes is made to put the topical on the tissue, um, but no, you put it on the gauze uh, about, you know, two millimeters thick. Uh, as you see that wetted area, it's just been lifted off the, the uh, bracket table and then laid across the tissue there five to five. You know, in this treatment application, I'm using differential anchorage where I'm only perforating the lower arch because I want 
a maximum mo distal movement of the lower arch with this, these CS2000 springs. Uh, for denoalveolar class 3 correction and improvement, uh, maybe some, you know, upper anchorage loss, but, you know, that's my thought process there. Um, this certainly is a patient that can tolerate CS2000 springs, has healthy joints. If there's really inflamed retrodiscal tissues on somebody, then you probably don't want to be perfor or, excuse me, wearing CS2000 springs. So maybe some other form of anchorage rather than the upper arch would be appropriate, like, say, mini screws in the buckle shelf of the mandible. Um, there are also vertical components uh, to consider with that movement, but I'm deviating here a little bit. Back to the placement of uh, topical then. That's what it looks like in the mouth with your cheek retractors. Both arches or a single arch, if we were doing an Invisalign case, we'd do both. And, and I have the patient sit at 45 degrees. They've got a patient napkin on. Um, they are uh, upright like that, and then the assistant is babysitting saliva because if they're all the way upright, they really start to drool while they're waiting for the top to take effect. Um, so that's, you know, protocol in the office. The, and the ladies sit, they cut those strips, and I come in and usually mark tissue with an indelible pencil so they'll, um, they'll know where I want it specifically if it's localized. Sometimes in morning huddle, I'll say, oh, yeah, that case is... Five to five lower, like I said this morning before this image was taken. Um, if it's an Invisalign case, you know, four to four or five to five upper and lower, and they just execute that for me. And you know, the rule of thumb, or the the um, variation on other recipes like TAC20, would be this: you've got um, you know a different um, amount of prilocaine and a different amount of tetracaine. The phenylephrine that's in there controls bleeding, but it also gives the material a shelf life. So you have to be aware of that and talk to your compounding pharmacist. But if you haven't tried this yet, I would. But it's not it, just the formula that makes a difference. It's also the use of that single-ply gauze. It's critical to keeping it from running. Um, people can get this on their soft palate and start to gag and have weird reaction that way. Some people can get it down their uh, oral pharynx and uh, sputter a little bit and sometimes feel like they're having difficulty swallowing. Um, you need to also pay attention to allergies too. If patients report any, any allergies at all, I'm a little more inclined to use maybe something uh, else and, and maybe even do some infiltrations with septicane. But in general, the large majority of people, especially if they don't have any allergies to any type of anything, this is a great um, mixture. But here's the other critical um, clue to this. I think you know, I've been putting on multiple layers of um, stuff causing tissue sloughing in, in the past. This is a wonderful protocol. You put the material on there like I showed with that gauze for three minutes, and then you wipe it with a dry piece and get it all off of the tissue and let it dry and don't do anything for 10 minutes. Uh, and you time that to the minute and you'll have great success. If you get there later than 10 minutes, then you might have some areas that, that need some more and aren't very numb. If you get there too early, then they're going to have patients where you invade the periosteum and they feel, uh, feel it. I used to do a lot of injections, but since others have shared this protocol with me, not so much, um, especially if it's on the buccal housing, which is where most of our perforations are happening. With the 10 millimeter sphere of influence, um, other than Otherwise, around, uh, other than around palatal canines, we want global movements of arches and accelerations of space closure. We're on the buckle and doing it this way. So set it, uh, your depth um, to those amounts or visualize it on your um, threads and, and rotate clockwise, you know, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. It makes sense and you get a tug and make sure you've got the threads in there to the depth that you want. It's, it's really not that difficult. Um, those who've never done any of this before, um, just, you know, pick something simple. Um, pick a simple space closure and just go in there and perforate and get a feel for what it feels like tactile. For those that are advanced, I mean, you can do five to five upper and lower in, in maybe four minutes of doctor time. It doesn't take a lot of time to visualize where the contact point is. Go directly apical to it. Make sure you're in a radicular. Have your x-ray up so you can see where you are and what you're doing. And at the end of the day, if you encroach on a root, so what? Pull it out, get out of the way, and we know that we have cementoclasts, excuse me, cementoblasts that help us in, in a very positive way to fill in any type of void you may create with a minor collision with a root. The literature helps us understand that. 
and I uh, to date have never had a situation where I actually went into a root head on and stayed in it and caused some sort of pulpal damage. I almost don't even think that's possible. It seems like the tactile aspects of that would be so obvious that it's, it's impossible for us to create that problem. So again, avoiding non steroidal anti inflammatories but using Tylenol uh, so as not to decrease the acceleration we're trying to create. Essentially, that's where you are, five millimeters from the gingival margin. With doctor control, localized delivery of acceleration with very little recovery time. Okay, so I'm hoping that most of us are caught up there. Um, general recommendations then are you really only need, for many patients, one or two devices at 10 or 12 week uh, intervals, all in movements, and even aligner patients as little as three day uh, tray changes. Those would be the general recommendations. So as far as costs, you got to plan from the. You can you, you got three different scenarios. You can plan from the beginning with two hundred three two to three hundred dollars to cover the cost. You can do it reactively at no charge and just have a bunch of the instruments around. Or you can say, you know, we're we're offering accelerated Invisalign and we charge six hundred dollars more, but you're going to finish in uh, dramatically less time. So it's kind of up to you to make a value assessment of what this brings to your practice. I would say that um, uh, my accelerated Invisalign patients are probably my happiest patients. And Dr. Shipley, I've got to thank him because he really came up with just an awesome um, uh, concept of the idea of delivering continuous force to teeth with aligners, just like we do with brackets and night tie wires, and then just manipulating the biology so that things tracked, track. And then reactively, when things don't track, backing up a few aligners and perforating around um, you know, non-extruded upper lateral incisors or stubborn bicuspid rotations, backing up, engaging attachments, and perforating localized around that individual tooth is really cool. Well, I'm not going to drag the patient back into the consultation room and say, hey, I got a $100 instrument here. You, you owe me 150 because that lateral incisor didn't track. No, I'm just going to have some around and do it. So in the summer, when the melt, snow all melts, we get out in the water and do a little wakeboarding. It's my son having a good time. So clinical examples then. We're down to 27 minutes according to my watch. Um, I'm going to show you some of the things that I don't know if they're inter inter introductory necessarily. They're just things that I think are the most applicable. Uh, future lectures in August and November, I'm hoping just to show uh, build on these examples and not spend as much time on the other material. So uh, moving fast now. Uh, I do this quickly so that you can see a myriad of things and those who want more information about specific stuff just email me at johnpobans at gmail and I can talk to you about whatever you want to know and even talk you through some cases and answer questions but you know that palatal canine bringing that thing in um, it, it's always a uh, you know a challenge how long is it going to take and what approach do we take I'm a big fan of the uh, Kokich open exposure have my doc do that where you know exposes the anatomical crown and gets on in there just with an eyelet, no chain at all, and then puts barricade gel into that lumen to fill it and then creates a healing cap that he smooths off with some Vaseline. I love that because it stays there for four months and emerges dramatically on its own vertically before I engage it with anything else. And so um, that's been a fantastic protocol that my periodontist and I next door use you know, frequently, but barricade gel is the key and a bonded eyelet is the other key, a uh, little pearl for you. But once it's down and we start applying force, then we start perforating. Usually perforate now on a 10-week interval. Some of these cases might show something different, but uh, again, using the rule of thumb of 10 millimeter sphere of influence and, and 10 uh, you know, weeks of activation, Sometimes in the palate, I'll do a little bit more just because it makes me feel good. <laughs> but again, I don't know. I probably would just do a, uh, this spot right here, you know, where that little um, nicodem spring is tugging on it uh, in between the arch wire and the canine and then maybe on the, the palatal aspect of the canine. But what I've noticed is as they move, yeah, there we go. There's my arrows. That's probably where I'd perforate, you know, targeting the periodontal ligament. Maybe that third one now would be less necessary probably find myself not doing four, but maybe just two or three. But um, the force couple applied there, I love what I'm seeing where if I go to two line angles of a canine in the palate, the spinning 
uh, effect of the acceleration is dramatic. If you think about how dense the, the palatal bone is, I mean, we love this area for mini screw placement for so many different applications just because it's so reliable. Well, that's also where we find these palatal canines parked right in the middle of it. So it's no wonder that we're creating a necrosis around um, traditionally exposed anatomical crowns of palatal, palatal impacted canines because of the density of the bone. It makes a lot of sense to clear that away and get rid of that obstacle, but it also makes a lot of sense to essentially aerate the area and take that really dense bone and um, soften it and create localized osteopenia so that we can spin teeth where we want them to go. But you can see this progression of 4 to 10 to 15 as, as we do, you know, I guess if there was a call for any more frequency and more amount of uh, perforations beyond the 10 to, and 10 rule, it would be palatal canines. I think you could probably justify doing it every six weeks and doing one at each line angle and one on the trail. So that would probably be the exception. Like everything else that we teach each other and do, there's always some exception to certain guidelines. Palatal canines is probably one of them. I find myself doing more. So in 21 weeks, you know, we get that thing all the way rotated out, but yeah, it's that dramatic rotation that we all despise once we finally get that tooth to land and how long it takes. I'm, I'm loving how quickly those are spinning into place once we get into a, a full wire and how quickly the, the palatal position apex of the canine seems to want to track out there as we apply labial root torque to, to it with the you know, a correct inverted, a correctly inverted bracket or whatever else your preference is um, to get it there. Um, so, yeah, Palo Cana has been great. Um, this is one I've showed in the past uh, that, you know, we're using some mini screw anchorage. Don't do that so much. You know, a TPA with some little tubes coming out of it, it seems to work great with this palatal approach if you don't want brackets on. But there's your cocage exposure healing caps as described with the barricade gel sitting and waiting and erupting vertically and then once they're in we decide to put fixed appliances on everywhere and go after it but the startling thing is with these perforations where they are you know working through I kind of did more even then than I do now but you know over a six month period of time they, they get all the way out into the arch I think this shows up in some of the propel literature it's not necessarily a new set of images this is the same patient it's been criticized that it's a different patient because this, this last image just shows clear brackets but is my son's friend, somebody here in town just totally missed the fact that he had palatal canines. He was class one with primary canines in that spot, and so he was never referred for treatment, never had a pano until he was 16. And when he finally did, they were there, and he was bummed that he would have to go to all these high school dances with metal brackets on. So once we got the canines out there, our ways, I, I swapped him out to clear. Just so you know, and study the Ruge, it's definitely the same patient. I'm happy to share those images and whatever with anybody else who might question it. So um, we place um, stainless steel mini screws in the infrazygomatic crest, uh, extra ridiculous because it allows us to distalize posterior segments. Uh, really cool that we can bite the bone and then bend and not have the tip fracture, but, which might happen with a titanium mini screw, but with a 2x12 stainless steel screw, we can do that. And then all of some of the famous speakers out there, John Lin and Chris Chang and others, we're able to gain control. In this application, we really don't need too much dramatic distalization, but we can man manage a palatal canine with a 3D lever arm. So uh, in that case, you know, in this case, we're driving that upper midline to the left that deviates to the right. We've got a separate anchorage unit allowing us to apply both eruptive and lateral force to that canine and perforate around it to get there um, from that upper image to completion in 20 weeks time. So I was really happy about that as it popped out there. And we got the little bonded ponic, you know, serving as something aesthetic that either can grow or shrink as you open space or close space. Molar intrusion, you know, we, we intrude super erupted molars with mini screw anchorage. We also intrude posterior teeth to correct open bites and rely upon mandibular auto rotation. Uh, one of my Mini screw cases at the University of Pacific requires lower molar protraction with mini screw anchorage uh, with really dense uh, cortical bone where those first molars were lost even in childhood. And we also need individual intrusion of those super erupted upper molars. And so 
Dr. Gluck was the resident um, out of Nashville, I think, that uh, worked on this case. Most of the uh, clinical work was done by him. I was just overseeing, but little Pearl, when you're intruding these molars, um, all, uh, uh, oh, Dr. Neal, our, our, our famous one there in uh, Virginia, um, that puts separators there between teeth during the intrusion process so that the heights of contour don't create a collision. That's a wonderful pearl. Night tie ones or rubber ones, night tie if they're too tight, but that really allows the intrusion. But then if you perforate the um, opposite line angles like that and like that, uh, and also then on the distal buckle, um, you get a rapid intrusion and get those you know molars up to the uh, occlusal plane, usually within four months is what I'm seeing, you know, like these images show. And you'll bond, bond the triad to the occlusal surfaces and as you're uprighting the lower at the same time, I guess, you know, I'd be justified to perforate down there on the bottom too if you want to speed that up, but usually um, in a case like that I wait and start bringing those molars forward with perforations later. So. Um, molar intrusion then for open bite, we think of mini screw anchorage. This is an interesting case where, you know, we got to a certain point in treatment, we managed the transverse discrepancy and the crowding, and then I'd listen to Dr. Pitts talk about doing squeeze exercises. I think Wick Alexander and a few others in the presence of posterior turbos have talked about squeezing six, 60 times, six sets of that uh, per day. I, I thought, well, why not perforate around those molars and accelerate that process? And so in this patient, we did that. We locally perforate perforated around the molars only uh, with triads, occlusal stops on the sixes and sevens. And uh, as we um, did our squeezing, we got an intrusion, a, a concomitant mandibular autorotation and an open bite closure in just a three month period of time from that point forward. So I was really happy about that because this young man was heading off on a, a Mormon mission and had a timeline to reach and I was happy that we didn't just try to do that open bite closure with anterior extrusion, which would have been relatively unstable, and then also, um, you know, probably it would have increased his gingival display. So two perforations procedures done uh, to get that case finished and, and and out of brackets at that point. So you can see some of the cephalometrics and how we maintain the smile line rather than increasing the display and the amount of molar intrusion that we got, and that was without mini screw anchorage. It was pretty cool. It, that was just with squeeze exercises and um, occlusal stops and perforations around the molars. Kind of cool. And then the occlusal plane change, we did have some extrusion just with our, our leveling and our bracket placement um, of the upper incisors, that is. Uh, on mass movements then, uh, some of the things that I've shown in the past is the ability to intrude maxillary uh, arches uh, without surgery. Uh, I'm not the only one. Uh, Ed Lynn out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, I think showed that long before I ever did, but I got excited about it and showed it at a few meetings. Um, the ability to um, retract segments past an imperzygomatic crest screw or essentially distalize whole arch or, or partial arches and then mandibular arch retraction. I'm really going to accelerate now because we're getting down to 16 minutes, but you know, this gingival display case, uh, you know, vertical maxillary excess, there's the mini screw anchorage with the palatal bar. This growing patient gets this great change, but she's growing, and uh, that was one of the things that really helped us. This was prior to doing any acceleration. Again, another case like this with full arch intrusion, that, you know, lip incompetent case treated with similar mechanics to intrude. Here's a teenage boy in adolescence, getting a, a great improvement in his smile line with the same mechanics. This is a, a really sought after thing now. People come asking for this because I've been doing it for a while, especially siblings and cousins who have genetic patterns that are similar. Um, it pays to invest in some time to learn how to do this confidently. A uh, dramatic amount of gingival display where originally the pre-treatment image, the family didn't want to do any of this, but then with some growth a year later, they said, oh, can you please start that? And we did, but these are all growing patients. There's a bonded version of a TPA that we use with the mini screw anchorage, controlling, you know, flaring with a chain that's incisal to the brackets uh, during the intrusion, and that's the amount of display that's corrected. Again, a rapidly growing patient, great things happen, 
In a non-growing patient, though, you get a buildup of bone at CEJ, as reported by Bowman and some other fantastic clinicians out of Asia, that uh, non-growing patients will get a buildup of bone at CEJ if you attempt this. So I had, up until this point, yet to do it on an adult, but John Graham shows this case where he did do full arch intrusion with miniscule anchorage and then needed osseous recontouring after the fact to get this amazing outcome, but there was no Lefort procedure at all. Uh, for that. So my hypothesis then became why not do this on adults and perforate both to speed it up and also prevent exostosis from forming at all. And we had a Brazilian lady that heard a lecture and wanted it for herself. She's an orthodontist and was treated by Dr. Storino uh, there in Sao Paulo with the same protocol but including perforations. And I share this then with permission from her uh, set of slides. She takes credit as the clinician. All I did was advise from a distance, but you know, at the time probably perforating probably too high in uh, soft tissue, um, probably perforating too too often and also went on the palatal. I think the 10 millimeter rule in keratinized tissue would have been just as effective, but she got 10 millimeters of change in 11 months, which is double the rate of what we were normally seeing in other reported cases. So this concept of uh, alveolar remodeling in the presence of perforations is definitely real and a, definitely a, an additional thing to ne take note of and, and recognize as we treatment plan that normal amounts of on mass intrusion uh, are at these level in terms of time and in the presence of perforation that was doubled. Another really cool case showing an asymmetric intrusion um, out of Brazil. Um, some of the best orthodontics is happening in, in South America these days. I'm always impressed with our international colleagues who, especially in the area of miniscrew mechanics, in some ways are ahead of us. And uh, we definitely have the challenge to stay with them. So powder is deep as can be. This is Champagne Powder in Utah. That's what we call a, a, a serious uh, flurry of uh, powder in the face. Segmental retraction, here's a, a d gentleman with an upper midline deviating to the left in the absence of tooth number 10. I want to create anchorage in that upper right segment and distalize from that half a step class 2 um, to a class 1, but do it without some sort of bulky palatal appliance. And so I place a mini screw, uh, extra ridicular, to allow the teeth to distalize past it with the bite and bend technique, and I decide to accelerate as I go. There's the bite and bend. Bite with a stainless steel tip and bend and insert, and then perforate those interproximals. I'm really doing just one perforation, five millimeters from the gingival margin at a depth of five millimeter wherever I do it, on the buckle only, unless it's a palatal canine. In general, that's, that's my protocol wherever I'm doing it. And this is just the upper right quadrant. We're push coiling on the opposite side with a growing ponic. We drive the midline to the right. And in 12 weeks with one perforation procedure, we, oh, sorry, we go to a class one. I stole my thunder there. Let's go back to this. No, this one. Yeah, you can see that nice buckle one, um, uh, nice class one buckle segment that was created. And load that with about 250 grams in the maxilla. If you're retracting lower teeth, you want to be about 350 grams. I really like this power chain that Orthoclassic sells. I have no relationship with them necessarily as a promoter these days, but they have great products just like everybody else, and that's one product I love and use all the time with my mini screw mechanics. Um, again, we did the squeeze exercise trick on this patient to get the bite to rotate closed with localized perforations. and he went from this open bite tendency then to um, uh, a ro auto rotated open bite correction. Midlines on, finished case, ready for an implant, and a uh, great use of perforation on an adult, as well as judicious mini screw anchorage uh, to be very efficient. Space closure then is a big one. You know, this is the first slide I ever saw from a propel. Um, brochure that made me make the first call. This is September of 2012. I said, if we can close space that fast, I want to do it. Four months is really rapid for that amount, and there's probably a little bit of tipping 
going on, but other applications, other cases that I've observed then uh, with mini screw mechanics that are a little more carefully uh, managed, uh, we've got a stainless steel mini screw back here. We've got a stainless steel strut with a, a loop bent forward that comes forward to engage a tube on the arch wire. We have a power arm to get to the center resistance at the tooth and also anteriorly, but our anchorage is back here. There is no mini screw anchorage here. There's a strut holding this anterior segment in place. And we then apply buccal and lingual forces and perforate. Um, so with that, we're, we're closing spaces um, rapidly, two and a half millimeters of change in that 10 week period of time, and then going you know, forward. So we're down to eight minutes. Um, I'm excited to show these space closures. If people have details about how I set that up with the buckle shelf screw and all that, please email me. But the key is buckle and lingual forces of 100 grams each to get that kind of translation without overdoing it and measure your forces in the presence of those perforations. Um, again, a resident case. So I'm going to accelerate now even more. Let's um, get into some of the archive um, space closure examples. Um, you know, you got 11 months to close that amount of space in the, in the presence of perforations. Here's a canine substitution case. You know, we go from here to that kind of space closure uh, with perforations. Probably not this many now. I probably would do about half of that using the 10 and 10 rule. The overall case takes that amount of time, but it's important to dial in on the, the space closure that that's seven months to close that space, which normally would have taken an enormous amount of time. Um, and she gets a great outcome, but you know we're seven months to go from that to that. So some other in interesting on mass movements, say you've got a asymmetric uh, mandible and you want to camouflage it, and uh, you've got a wisdom tooth in the way back here that you want to remove, that creates some wrap, and you say you want to just do a unilateral CS2000 spring rather than um, place a mini screw in the, in the posterior area back here, you can get some amazing change with an anchorage on top, you know, stabilize the upper arch and prevent the upper midline from moving. We did uh, perforations more frequently then, would do that less, but really accelerated to a midline correction in that amount of time. So showing the wisdom tooth being removed and showing that, that lower uh, asymmetric dental alveolar correction, about a seven or eight millimeter class three that uh, gave us a midline uh, coincident at the end. Similar case where we're camouflaging a really dramatic um, deviated lower midline. Someone took out an upper bicuspid, really didn't help us any, but you know, surgery was opted out of. Mini screw anchorage back here with application of force in the presence of perforations to get that midline to swing over into place. It's definitely um, not a board case, but we drive from the right with a uh, arch wire bound forces spring and we get a correction of overjet uh, and midline um, in the presence of mandibular asymmetry, but we satisfy this patient and get that outcome. It's certainly reasonable considering all the things that were thrown at us in the beginning and the inability to, to have a surgical procedure done. So perforating arches makes sense. These are the famous images of uh, Chris Chang using mini screw anchorage in the posterior inserted on a vertical and this you know 11 millimeter class 3 dental alveolar correction results in tipping of the second molars. When we perforate these cases distally we don't see that. This case shows both maxillary protraction and mandibular distalization in the presence of perforations posterior to the second molars. So we're protracting here and retracting here and we're not getting distal tipping of those second molars uh, as we perforate and we go to positive overjet. This case showed up in Orthotown at the AAO last spring. If you want a copy of it, you want to go study it and read about it in more detail, this patient's missing upper second molars congenitally but I'm thrilled with how it turns out that uh, we didn't get any distal tipping or problems as we retracted that lower arch on mass for a non-surgical correction. Another kind of uh, interesting twist is posterior crossbite correction on an adult. We look at a case like this where there's an accentuated curve of Wilson, a very collapsed upper arch. We perforated and used just arch wire, um, 
you know, expansion and, and light elastic forces and got an immense amount of change. Today I probably wouldn't do it on the, the palatal, but this adult with a full crossbite all the way to the second molars in eight weeks jumps out of crossbite beautifully. Um, another approach aside from elastics is also to use an overlay, put this little tube on the wire and use an expansion overlay. You could perforate on one side and have the other side be um, very uh, much uh, the active side, so a biological differential uh, anchorage segment. This is one of the archived photos or images from that I didn't treat, but uh, an, uh, an iatrogenic cant as somebody tried to bring in a, a canine that wouldn't extrude and essentially um, needed to recover. They've got a full dimension arch wire on the bottom, perforated that upper segment, and then had a vertical, Dr. Kathy George, a vertical biological anchorage differential where perforation in one arch allowed that to extrude with very little extrusion of the opposing arch in a very short amount of time to um, get that iatrogenic cant corrected. Um, ankylosed upper lateral incisor in the presence of a dramatic open bite, uh, you know, that's after weeks of being in it. We luxate it, we, you know, set it free from the adjacent tooth. We're doing all these mini screw mechanics to close the open bite, but we want to get this tooth to move. And in the presence of perforations and luxation, it does. I get that thing to come down and be at a reasonable vertical level to where the dentist then can put a veneer on it. So that's the finished outcome of that open bite. Ankylosed lower molar, uh, my friend Keith Sellers in North Carolina, this is his daughter. We put a mini screw in here. We perforated around this tooth and actually got it to move after multiple attempts at other things. Uh, buckle shelf, applied force, distalized the molar away from it, and over, I think, about a 12-week period of time after lots of other attempts, we finally got that tooth to extrude and come into place. Primary failure of eruption perhaps is a better diagnosis of that situation than ankylosis. Getting down to three minutes and losing time for questions, but I'll stay longer if anybody else wants to. Shipperly protocol then would be to perforate wherever there's crowding. He does it three to three in this very limited Invisalign case. It's one of the first ones that he shows with three-day tray changes. Optimized attachments, class two uh, elastic points, uh, for his setup, and just clicking through his slide, that's why it's rapid. He was doing three perforations. I don't really think you need to. Just one right here of the three is enough to get the same effect with the 10 and 10 rule. Five millimeter depth, essentially what we do. Um, just quickly going through his slides to show the outcome and the presence of these perforations up to six months later. CBCT still shows those. But there's a change, and he shows a dramatic outcome of three-day tray changes, 23 trays, 43 trays on the upper, 23 on the bottom, I guess. And so I decided, hey, I'm going to try this, and I modified it. I take my aligners, and I still double them from the initial clean check and subtract a few. I just feel more comfortable accelerating the three days doing that. I only do one perf. And I, you know, the rule is we do 20 trays in 60 days. People are gone for 60 days. They come back, and they've worn 20 trays in, in, in the interim. Here's the first case I did that way. It's a class one kind of collapsed arch case. She's crowded. She doesn't want braces. Um, you know, it's a classic arch development case. But we, we do the same protocol with the modification of three-day tray changes to get this outcome. 23 weeks, two perforation procedures. Very exciting that it went this well. Um, I'm happy that I can show one. All of you can have one to show in August if you want to share it with me so I can put it in the slides. But accelerated Invisalign with Propel 5 to 5 is really, really compelling. And these patients are really, really happy. I love the way her smile turns out. And there was a time there where I would have thought, no, that's going to take a full 12 to 15 to 18 months and braces and you know all kinds of bracket repositioning and different things, but she gets a great outcome. A few other brainstorms in closing. What about the effect upon rotations and other movements? What about attachment loss as we watch these? What about expanding unilaterally? Um, what about reactively managing non-tracking teeth? How about doing this with full bracketed cases and rapid archwire changes? What if we combine this with 
sure smile or vibration or light, what would all that do? These are questions I'd love for people to throw out to me as we prepare for our next webinar in August. I think everybody that's not doing it needs to take a bit of a leap like this gear going off the cliff. And in summary, uh, advantages over other methods of acceleration, there's definitely a basis of science behind this, and it's a compelling uh, modality for the future. Uh, my challenge is to you or all of you to get started if you aren't doing it and contribute to the knowledge base. Send some cases to me so that I can show them and add to this brainstorm list that I just threw up there. Let me know what you think. Uh, I'd love to hear and learn from you. Thanks a lot for your attention on this quick 60-minute webinar. There's my email. Um, I'm going to go to the Q&A, see if anybody asked a question real quick. Staying late for those who want to stay. Um, any control studies? Ted Rothstein. Is there any proof that treatment is accelerated? Propel versus non-propel. Okay, I think I showed the science behind that already. Hopefully that answered that question for Dr. Rothstein. And he's a... Uh, DDS and also a PhD and in practice for 36 years. I would refer you to that AJO study doctor and do that with the utmost respect uh, for your question regarding controlled studies. But I think that has been well addressed by the folks at Propel and Dr. Teixeira is probably the main author to look for and, and showing acceleration other than a rat. So I think that's the only question that shows up there. Anybody else that has a question proposed, please feel free to email me. Thanks so much for your time and attention, and have a good evening.